Hi, boys and girls. Good morning. Today, we are starting chapter six, and this is from the perspective of Peter. I really like how the chapters kind of alternate. So one chapter talks about from Peter's perspective, and then the second alternating chapter talks about the perspective packs. All right. <clears throat> Peter recognized the sounds before he was fully awake. The footfalls of a herd of just-released kids, their hoots, the thumping of their eager fists into gloves. He scrambled out from under the bench and grabbed his stuff. Too late. Twenty boys and their coach were streaming down the hill. Up at the parking lot, a bunch of adults were overseeing the hustle, and some of them wore uniforms. His best option was to join the dozen or so kids who were already scattered over the bleachers, heads bent together in clusters of two and three, and blend in when they left. Peter climbed the bleachers to the top row and dropped his pack. A kid watching a baseball practice, nothing could be more normal, yet his heart skidded. Below, the coach started lobbing fungos into the field. The players were mostly the usual guys you'd expect to see on a ball field, all muscle and shout. Peter found the one he wanted to watch, a small kid with a straw-colored, crew-cut, and bleached-out red t-shirt playing shortstop. While the rest of the players scrambled around like puppies, this kid was a statue, hands poised, waist high, eyes glued to the coach's bat. The instant Wood smacked cowhide, he sprang. Somehow, he managed to reach every ball that came anywhere near his territory, even though he was so short that he looked like someone's tag-along kid brother. Peter knew himself. Peter knew he himself wasn't the kind of kid you'd expect to find on a ball field either, and he was even less at home in the dugout with all the shoulder punching and trash talking. But a baseball field was the only place where he felt he was exactly where he was born to be. The feeling that brought Peter was something he had never tried to describe to anyone else, partly because it felt too private, but mostly because he didn't think he had the words to explain it. Holy came the closest, and calm was in the mix, but neither was exactly right. For a crazy minute, Peter sensed that the shortstop understood about the holy calm, was feeling it too right now. The coach had taken the mound and was tossing puff balls. The batters were hitting sharp liners and grounders, and the outfielders were finally paying attention, or at least facing in the right direction. The shortstop was still the one to watch. He looked like he was stitched together with live wires, gaze steady to the play. Peter recognized that kind of concentration. Sometimes his eyes would actually go dry because he forgot to blink. So focused was he on every move of every player and knew it paid off. Like the kid in the red t-shirt below him, Peter owned his territory on a ball field. He loved that territory right down to the cut grass, dry dust smell of it. But what he loved more was the fence behind it, the fence that told him exactly what was his responsibility and what wasn't. A ball fell inside that fence, he'd better field it. A ball soared over it and it wasn't his to worry about anymore. Nice and clear. Peter often wished that responsibility had such bright, tall fences around it, off the ball field too. When Peter's mother had died, he'd gone for a while to a therapist. At seven years old, he hadn't wanted to talk or maybe he just hadn't known how to shrink that kind of loss into words. The therapist, a kind-eyed woman with a long silver braid, said that was okay, that was perfectly okay. And for the whole session, Peter would pull little cars and trucks from a toy box. There must have been a hundred of them there. Peter figured later that the woman had cleaned out a toy store for him and crashed them together two by two. When he was finished, she would always say the same thing. That must have been hard for you. Your mom gets in a car to go buy groceries a regular day, and she never comes home. Peter never answered, but he remembered a sense of brightness about those words and about the whole hour as if he was finally where he should be, and there was nothing else he should do, nothing else he should be doing except crashing those little cars and hearing that it must have been hard for him. Until one day, the therapist said something else. Peter... Do you feel angry? No, he'd said quickly. Never. A lie. And then he'd gotten off the floor and taken a single green apple Jolly Rancher from the brass bowl by the door, exactly the way he did at the end of every session. That was the deal the kind-eyed therapist had made with him. Whenever he'd had enough, he could take a candy and the session would be over and left. 
But outside, he kicked the candy into the gutter, and on the way home, he told his father he wasn't going back again. His father hadn't argued. In fact, it had seemed a relief to him, but not to Peter. He had the nice therapist. Had the nice therapist known all along he'd been angry that last day that he'd done something terrible, that as a punishment, his mother hadn't taken him to the store? And did she blame him for what happened? A few months later, Peter had gotten packs. He'd come across a fox run over by the side of the road near his house. So soon after watching his mother's coffin lowered into the ground, he'd felt an unshakable need to bury the body. As he looked around for a good place, he'd found the den filled with three cold, stiff kit bodies and one little ball of gray fur still warm and breathing. He'd tucked Pax into his sweatshirt pocket and brought him home and said, not asked, said, I'm keeping him. His dad had said, okay, okay, for a while. The kit mooed piteously all through the night, and hearing him, Peter had thought that if he could visit the kind-eyed therapist again, he'd smash those toys' cars together all day and night, all day and night, forever. Not because he was angry, just to make everybody see. Thinking out packs made the old anxiety snake tighten around Peter's chest. He needed to get moving again, make up some time. The practice was breaking up now, boys lopping from the field, shedding equipment as they streamed past the dugout. As soon as the field was clear, he dropped from the bleachers, pulled his backpack down, and hitched it over his shoulders. Just as he set out along the diamond, though, he saw the shortstop. Peter hesitated. He should take off, try to blend in with the stragglers leaving the school grounds. But the rest of the team had left this kid to bag up the equipment and walk back alone, and Peter knew how that felt. He picked up a couple of balls and handed them over. Hey, the boy took the balls with a cautious smile. Hey, nice play. The last liner, that ball had hair. The boy looked away and scuffed at the dirt, but Peter could see he was pleased. Yeah, well, the first baseman made it look cleaner than it was. Nah, you planted that ball. Your first baseman would be lucky to catch a cold by himself. No offense. The boy gave Peter a real grin. Yeah, coach's nephew. You play? Peter nodded. Center field. You know here? Oh, I don't live here. I, Peter nodded his head vaguely south. Hampton? Yeah, Hampton. Right. The boy's face closed, scouting before Saturday's game. Jerk. He spat and walked back to the dugout. As he left the school grounds, Peter congratulated himself on quick thinking, covering his runaway tracks, but somehow he felt kind of bad anyway. Somehow he felt lousy, actually. He shrugged the feeling off. What was it his dad said about feelings? Something about a quarter and a cup of coffee? And checked his watch. 4.15. He'd lost over three hours. Peter pressed faster. But when he came to the town square again, he crossed to the opposite side from the hardware store and forced himself to walk at an even pace past a library, past a bus station, past a diner. Then he counted off a thousand steps before he risked lifting, lifting his head. When he did, he checked his watch again, 4.50. His grandfather was probably packing up his stuff now. Peter imagined him walking to his rusty blue Chevy, fitting the key into the ignition. And with that image, his anxiety struck, knocking the breath right out of him. He scaled a low wooden fence and dropped into scrubby brush. He pushed in a good safe 30 feet until the saplings rose up taller than he was, until his anxiety let him breathe right again. Before turning to parallel the road, it was rougher going now, but 15 minutes later, he reached it, the highway. Peter shadowed the entrance map, crouching low, then at a break in traffic, ran down the culvert, scaled the chain link fence, and dropped to the other side, his heart beating hard. He'd made it. He loped into the trees, keeping an eye out for a likely place to cut west, and in just a few minutes, he found one, a dirt road running perpendicular to the highway. Well, not much more than an old wagon path, to be honest, but it was heading in the right direction and would be easy walking even at night. He turned in. For a short while, the trees behind him grew denser as he walked, and only bird calls and squirrel rustlings broke the silence. Peter realized he might have seen the last of civilization for a while. The thought lifted him. But a few minutes later, the road turned a corner and began to run along an old pasture dotted with gnarled fruit trees and ragged bloom. 
A stone wall bordered the field and a low barn stood at the far corner. There were no lights on in the barn, no car or truck beside it. Still, Peter's heart crashed. The barn looked freshly painted and some of the roof shingles were the raw pink of new wood. This was the road to someone's home. Worse, it might lead to a bigger road. The atlas had been too old to show. In any case, it wasn't a shortcut across the hills. Peter dropped his pack and sank into a narrow jog in the stone wall. Exhausted and starving, he hugged his boots off and peeled down his socks. Two bad blisters throbbed on each heel. They were going to kill when they broke. Peter dug out his extra pair of socks from the bottom of the backpack and worked them on over the first pair. He rested his head back against the rough stone, still giving off a little warmth from the day's sun, which was now hovering just over the line of trees, bathing the field in a peach-colored glow. He pulled the raisins out and ate them one at a time, taking small sips of water in between. Then he opened two packets of string cheese and took four crackers from the sleeve. He ate as slowly as he could, watching the sun over the orchard, surprised to find that he could actually mark its sinking mo movement. How had he lived 12 years and never known this about sunsets? Peter laced his boots just as he started to rise. He caught sight of a deer, which bounded into the orchard from the woods beyond. He held his breath as the orchard filled, 14 deer in all. They began to graze, and a few nibbled delicately at the low branches of the trees. Peter squatted back down, and the closest one, a doe with a spindly spotted fawn beside her, turned her head to look directly at him. Peter raised his palms slowly, hoping to let her know he meant no harm. The doe moved between Peter and her fawn, but after a while she dipped her head into the grass again. And then the clear twilight air was split by the screech of a saw biting through wood from behind the barn. The herd startled in unison and peeled away into the darkening woods, their white tails flashing. Before she bounded off, the doe sent another look straight at Peter, one that seemed to say, you humans, you ruin everything. Peter took off back at the highway. Half the cars had their headlights on now, and it seemed they were all trained directly on him. He ducked off the road. The ground there was spongy and smelled of peat. He was just debating about risking the flashlight when his foot sank with a splash. He grabbed an overhanging branch and pulled himself out, but it was too late. He could feel cold swamp water seeping into his boots. Peter cursed. Not bringing more socks, another mistake. It had better be the last of the trip. And then, clambering back to higher ground, made another, much worse mistake. His right foot caught on a root and he fell. He heard the bone break, a soft, muffled snap. At the same time, he felt the sharp stab. He sat, panting with the stunning pain for a long moment. Finally, he pulled his foot free and unlaced his boot, wincing at each motion. He eased down the wet socks, and what he saw made him gasp. His foot was swelling so fast that he could actually see it. Peter rolled his sock back up, nearly crying out as the pain it caused, then gritted his teeth to work his foot back into the boot before it could swell any more. He crawled to a tree and pulled himself upright. He tested his weight on his foot and nearly collapsed again. The pain was far worse than anything he'd felt before. It made the broken thumb feel like a mosquito bite in comparison. He couldn't walk. Oh, that's the end of chapter six. I hope you have a great day. See you tomorrow.